you've reached the Signal Watch. Movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine cultural artifacts of the 20th century, boldly explore the 21st, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. everybody and welcome back to the signal watch as always i'm your host ryan steens and with me today we have a brand new guest someone who i am absolutely thrilled has agreed to join us uh and introduce yourself sir uh hello everyone i am stephen harms uh stephen and i have known each other virtually for 20 years i guess i'd yeah. say wow that's crazy yes yeah i know time's flying man um uh, but in person we met in 2006 we both moved back to austin within maybe four months of each other or something right, like yeah. that and steven actually left a mysterious note on my front door stoop before i ever met him that he'd swung by and we hadn't happened to be home so that was my, my first physical interaction with steven and lauren his wife <laughs> Um, I will also say I officiated at your wedding, so I need that to, was true. Yeah, give give, give kudos for so I am available for weddings and bar mitzvahs um, and bat mitzvahs if if you need need some help. So, um, but Stephen, you uh, I I was very very pleased you wanted to come in, uh, but you've brought a weightier movie than say the average James Bond movie that we cover on this podcast. And make no doubt, I do. I do love hearing the discussion of uh, uh, you know B grade British uh, sci fi or or, or, or or spy exploits in the Arctic. I, I, I do love all this. I'm waiting for the Ice Station Zebra episode. Um, but uh, yes, I, I am bringing to you uh, Stanley Kubrick's 1971 film adaptation of Anthony Burgess's novel, the same title, A Clockwork Orange. So, did you ever read the novel? I want to start there. I did not, um, but my dad decorated with it. <laughs> so I, I didn't realize this, but uh, I think he'd gone to like some, uh, some like, you know, book by the yard sale and, and like tried to like fill up a, a bookshelf that we had at the head of our, 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 our stairs and, and on our home. And I always used to see the title of Clockwork Orange. And I thought it was very strange. Only years later did I realize that what it was about. And I, I started to wonder what people must have thought upon entering our, our house and seeing this book in such a prominent place. Um, but no, I've never read the book. Uh, even to this day, I, I, I still would like to. Um, I think there's some subtle contours there. Um, that, that surfaced in doing some of my research for the podcast here, things that I think uh, Anthony Burgess was very insightful about. So I look forward to digging into it. But as of yet, my, my sole frame is established by Kubrick's work. Fair enough. Um, Have you read the book? I, I did. I read it in high school. So I usually, as, as always, you know, we kind of talk about our first experience with, with the movie or whatever. Uh, so I was the kid. So when I was about 14, my brother who was 16 at the time and had a driver's license would, you know, we would take the mom's rental card to United video or whatever. And he was starting to get the movies at that point that his friends who had older siblings had seen that were, he was then being told to watch. So I was experiencing that same sort of thing, maybe two years behind him. So that was when I first saw in about two weeks time, this, the exorcist, there was just like this, uh, maybe the Amityville horror. There were like all these movies that were like, these are not what you have been watching. We're now moving past seeing like Indiana Jones and stuff like that. Um, I think Blade Runner might have been in that pile of movies as well. Um, yeah. And so 
I, I very much remember watching this during that time frame, um, and watched it a few times in high school. I will, and I watched it a few times in college until I kind of got to the point of like, okay, I've seen it and I'm not uncomfortable with it, but I also don't know who to watch this with anymore. Right. <laughs> um, at, Jamie's never seen it. And I, we taught, we had a whole conversation before I was going to watch it for the podcast. I don't think I've seen it in 20 years. Um, and I was like, this is an opportunity. We're going to be thinking about it very critically. And you're going to hear a podcast about it afterward. And she was like, everything you've told about it, I'm taking a hard pass. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Um, no, I think that's what's pretty profound about what you're bringing up right there is, um, you know, one is, is the timing, right? Is like, I think I saw it probably you know, similar within, you know, plus or minus two years of you. Uh, what's interesting is that if that came out in 71, let's say you're watching it in 91, roughly it was about 20, you know, 20 some years old at that point uh, to, to put it in perspective, movies that are about that same age right now are men in black Two, the Scorpion King, a, a, a lesser, uh, a, a lesser, the rock production. Uh, the top grossing film of, of 2002 was Spider-Man uh, shortly followed by attack of the clones. So it's amazing to think is that if I look, if you look at the list of box office grosses from the film's, that were 20, were 20 years away from when you watch Clockwork Orange and that you would need to, another 20 years after it, still have that kind of like trigger warning with your wife discussion. I also had it with my same wife too, or not ours, with my wife as well, uh, to, to basically iron out whether or not she wanted to watch it with me. I can't think of a movie from 20 years ago that still feels as dangerous as a Clockwork Orange does 40 years later. Um, and I think that's, you know, one that kind of speaks to how, how, fertile 1971 was for cinema, but also it just speaks to, there's something about this no, uh, novel and this film that really is jarring, is really confrontational. And I think we, we engage with it. If you look at it critically and intellectually, there's something that's also attractive about it. There's something that it says that's so profound and done so well that while you're repulsed, you're also kind of like, I, I also want to see it again and make sure I, I, I explored that track in my brain circuits uh, with, with, with the intention that I think Kubrick and, and, and Burgess and, and also Malcolm McDowell wanted us to, to pursue it with. So um, yeah, for sure. I, I think it's amazing that it's, that it still requires kind of a, a bracketing discussion before you show it to someone. Yeah, 100%. And, and part of what I went through on kind of that curve was um, so to give you an idea of the kind of kid I was in high school, I was, I wore on the day before Christmas, before we all were dismissed for Christmas, I wore a $2, you know, bought it Ecker drug Santa hat in which I had written in black marker, the word kill across the white. And I wore it to school. Nobody stopped me all day. You know, now, you know, now you'd be thrown into ISS for the rest of the year <laughs> for doing this thing. But anything I could think of that was like, Oh, this is, I'm not going to do anything directly, but passively I'm going to be a little provocative was something I thought was a great idea. I was the kid who wore the smiley face shirt with the bullet hole in the middle of the uh, forehead, yeah, you know, yeah, classic. and um, you know, all the standard, like I'm going to just be a dickish 17 year old who knows where the line is and how to make people uncomfortable, but not get thrown into detention. So, but the, so I was wearing similarly my Alex t-shirt, probably in a like 10 day rotation or something like that. I, yeah. I, had, I had my clockwork. My parents had no idea what clockwork orange was. They knew right. there was a strange guy in a bowler hat with a knife on this right. t-shirt. And that's all they knew. Um, if they ever looked at it that hard, you know, which, which I sincerely doubt they did. So, right. and I dressed as Alex to the, my senior year, of the drama club's Halloween party. I thought you were going to say prom, and I was about to, I was about to follow my trigger. <laughs> not, not, that would have been amazing, but not the prom. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of where I was. And, and people either knew it or they didn't. And they were just kind of like, Alex, huh? And you're like, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, as I got into college, I, I, I you know, maybe, maybe this is not a, while I understood the film on some level, I didn't really think very much about like, what are you saying by wearing a clockwork orange t-shirt? Right. What are you saying by dressing as Alex for Halloween? 
Um, especially if you're doing it by yourself, I can almost see it being a different thing. If you're going to sixth street and you and your three droogs are you yes, know, yes, all yes. dressed up, right. but that's not what I was doing. And I dialed it way back after all that of, of, of course, I was just basically saying, look at me. I've seen this thing. I basically understood it. And so I'm wearing a billboard that says, you know, I, I participated in whatever Clockwork Orange is up to. And I think that's, um, I think it's, you're speaking a little bit to sort of the power of the film. You know, I think my first introduction to the, the concept of it as a, as a film was, um, was The Simpsons, where you think about that generation of, of kids that basically came out from the Harvard Lampoon. I, I, I too, sir, you know, pinkies up and then esteemed intellectual who have seen a hyper-violent movie and have deep thoughts about it. Um, you know, there's a, a scene where uh, Santa's little helper, the dog from The Simpsons, if you're not familiar, uh, basically undergoes aversion therapy and has her eyeballs propped open like the in the Ludovico device. And there's also uh, a brilliant episode where Lisa um, negatively conditions Bart uh, around getting electric shocks for cupcakes. And uh, the scene on The Simpsons is basically Bart reaching for two beautiful ripe cupcakes and then the clockwork orange you know cheese synthesizer kicks in and he starts having the the aversion reactions um not to get too much in the plot here but it, the, so much of the plot has 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 moved into sort of i don't want to say hipper than thou but but, but definitely hip culture you know to, to the point that exactly to say you know every spencer's gifts or hot topic has you know has that beautiful shot of malcolm mcdowell's you know with his with his uh eyelash makeup and you know, you know the from the original poster so yeah it, it is it does cast a long shadow into, into popular culture uh for sure yeah i definitely think it was a certain um shibboleth to say like i i have i'm participating with with culture and with you know film and um just a whole lot of things that are associated with this film um the same way I also wore like a t-shirt that had a picture of Samuel Beckett on it for fuck's sake. Like, <laughs> um, like look, th- th- I'm not, I'm not going to be edgy by wearing an Aussie shirt. I'm going to wear Alex from clockwork orange. Um, and you're, uh, and you're uh, my, my dinner with Andre lunchbox. Yes. <laughs> that really set the stakes. <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, it. Uh, I guess I was a pretentious little shit. And, and this, this, and I, I do think that there was a period in the nineties where our generation of course is reflecting back the stuff they liked. And, and like you said, it showed up in the Simpsons and things like that. Um, we are now supposed to be doing plot summaries. They are actually sponsored now by South coast. Oh, media. Yeah. Yes. South yes. coast media of Houston, Texas for all of your South coast media needs. Awesome. Um, I don't know entirely what they do, but I know they have a studio and they have people who make video stuff that you can put on the internets or on the TVs. And so if you're in the greater Houston area and you need South coast media, you should absolutely use them. So Steven, usually I do the plot summary, but you actually did what I would consider to be almost an edit decision list. Like I'm breaking down a book for my class in college breakdown. So you probably have a better ability right now to do a plot summary than I do. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think, you know, I'm not, not a, a literary scholar here, but um, I, I think the, the movie is basically split into to five acts uh, and for, for two hour runtime, that's probably pretty typical. I think the opening uh, 15 minutes, it, it's shocking to think that the, the most sort of scarring part of the, the film, the, the, the scenes that hinge on, uh, on, on the, the most out front violence and, and, and sexual, um, s- sexual violence, are, are basically all bracketed in 15 minutes. The rest of it's basically a PhD philosophy seminar. But the first 15 minutes that, that really make that, that visceral gut punch are all effectively in the first 15 minutes. And I, I call that act, um, act one, Alex the Animal, Silverback of the Droogs. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to communicate there is that we, it's, it's almost like, um, like a, an Audubon kind of thing. It's like the state of nature of these, uh, what, what's, what's called in the movie, hoodlums. Uh, and we basically see what their, what their code, what their ethics and what their pressures are. So uh, we're introduced to a, a group of hoodlums um, and we're introduced with, uh, to, with them uh, in their sort of normal haunt, which is a bar in which uh, drug-laced milk is sold. And we're also introduced to their sort of unique way of speaking, which is uh, Cockney English laced with Russian. 
So if you know Russian and you're watching this movie, you immediately have this sort of visceral sense of, oh, this is what happens if the Cold War goes the other way, perhaps a little bit. So um, the, the dialogue uh, establishes that there, it's sort of this cockney rhyming slang crossed with, um, crossed with Russian. And what proceeds to happen in that opening act is Alex and his droogs basically engage on some, some mayhem. Uh, they start by beating up a character identified as the tramp. That is to say they, they beat up a, an unhoused individual. Uh, they then proceed um, to play a uh, steel car and then proceed to run people off of the road. Uh, then they um, make a surprise break and entry into an individual's home, a, a writer, as well as his wife. Uh, and then they proceed to uh, rape him, or excuse me, rape her before uh, the husband in sort of a, a sort of a, a cuckoldish kind of uh, humiliation play. Uh, that round of bullying done, they go back to the Krova milk bar for a, a drug laced nightcap where they uh, encounter some high culture folks. And uh, we suddenly become introduced that, to the idea that this hoodlum is keenly interested in Ludwig van Beethoven. And that's kind of where, where the, the sort of visceral gut punch of act one ends. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a quick run through of act two, uh, two through five. Uh, I won't say as much about it. Uh, but act two, we basically zoom out from the, the silverback, uh, Alex, and we see Alex and his, his friends or the droogs in uh, their world which is, uh, again, uh, a, a very dysfunctional, over-bureaucratic uh, dystopia, sort of hints of um, the Soviet bureaucracy there. Uh, and then what happens is uh, Alex, one of his uh, forays goes wrong, and he is basically sent to prison in effort to shorten his, the, the length of his time. He uh, hears word of an aversion therapy, basically imagine sort of like a, a B.F. Skinner shocks for negative operant conditioning gone uh, amok. And basically what happens is Alex is exposed to a series of movies and drugs, which make him sick when he sees violence or sex uh, and thus effectively neutered of his sort of more violent and base urges. He was released back into society where society proceeds to revenge itself upon him uh, such to the point that he seeks uh, an exit via suicide. And that doesn't go to plan. And instead it winds up that he uh, becomes an inconvenient tool for exposing the hypocrisy of modern life and he is promptly shut up and bought off by the interior ministry. Uh, and he concludes it with saying, I was cured all right, uh, with all the hints of his old menace come back to the surface. So uh, it's, it's a, a sort of a circular story, but uh, the, the, the joy, if you will, is in, is in traveling that circle with him. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting, and I won't talk about what occurs in the chapter until the very end of the podcast, so you don't need to worry about jumping over it or anything um is there the the movie reflects the first 20 chapters of the novel uh the novel was mostly published for a long time with just those of the 21st chapter missing um and the 21st chapter that it was in the version i read had been reinserted um and i think in many ways fundamentally changes the entire point of both <laughs> of the story um but I'm going to save that till the very, very end of the, cool. the podcast. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it does have this, um, you know, I can see how you would watch this movie. This movie was banned in England, um, which I find fascinating given it was filmed there probably with some, you know, government support as a lot of films were, were done then. Um, and, but then once it actually came time to release it, they decided we're not going to release this. And when I knew that as a teenager, I always believed, oh, that was because they didn't want people thinking this is like the Warriors or something, a Walter Hill movie and going out and wearing, you know, jock straps and, and carrying canes and beating hobos, which may have been one of the reasons. Um, I don't know what hooliganism looked like in England in 1970s uh, very well. I, I've read various things about, you know, you're on the other side of really the mods and, and you're heading, you know, but now you're also into like swinging London and all that by then. Um, so now watching it, I have very different opinions of why the government would have wanted to shut this movie down. Yeah, sure. um, I don't really know much about what was going on in the government pre Thatcher. Um, but I can imagine this, this movie is um, not particularly kind 
to 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 views of of how the government tends to work um, and and how it tends to deal with the media and the masses. Um, all of which I wouldn't say went over my head when I watched it as a teen, but certainly watching it now as a forty six year old man feels like that's really the front forward thing of this movie as much or more than what actually happens to Alex. What happens to Alex to me now feels much more incidental to what is happening, whatever the, whatever the government is up to um, it, as far as the story goes. Fully agree. Fully agree. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like the, the, you know, knowledge is that Frankenstein is the, the, is not the monster. And then wisdom is the insight that, Frankenstein is the monster, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. it, it's that moment uh, that, that Clockwork Orange, I think, gives us is, is, you, is you kind of say like, oh, Alex is the monster. And, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of say like, uh, I, I just want to say this, Malcolm McDowell is gorgeous. He is, is beautiful. Uh, he's young. Uh, he's filmed in this kind of, uh, it's, it's interesting the way sexual roles are, are defined in Clockwork Orange. Uh, Alex has very feminine affectations. He has uh, hyper extended eyelashes, right? But yet he's also incredibly violent. Uh, he's also, um, when he goes out uh, record shopping, he's dressed like um, th- the purple velvet dandy from, from Swing and Carnaby Street. But in, in the next scene, he's, he's, he has absolutely no remorse about pulling a knife on, on one of his drukes. So we, he's like this kind of like id out of control. And the way I look at Alex is the way I would look at like, a lion in the Serengeti is like, he is literally an animal. And when you look at it, um, and I certainly didn't have the language for this. Um, when I, when I, when I saw it, you know, thanks to, you know, four years of a philosophy degree, I, I now do, but, uh, he, he is like this sort of Schopenhauerian study case in just will. He wants things. He wants drugs. He wants women, uh, he, he wants, you know, fights. He wants to win fights. He wants to see fights. Uh, he is like just this almost like state of nature, kind of like, like he's not a noble savage. He's an ignoble savage, but you, you're not surprised to see that. That's just the way lions in the Serengeti, you know, reserve are. What's fascinating is when we start trying to go in and say, oh, hello. Um, uh, I'll, I'll steal one of my favorite um, lessons from one of my favorite philosophy professors, uh, the late Robert Solomon he said like, Imagine you walk in and you see a silverback gorilla and you see him swinging on the tire swing and you look at him and you go, how childish. And you slowly shame the gorilla into not being the gorilla. I think that's the sort of idea that we're dealing with in Clark or Orange and that like there are other types of violence which aren't as visceral as what Alex demonstrates in the first act, but they are, they are violence just the same and they are even more powerful. And I think putting those types of violences, government violence, religion is violence, uh, tax policy is violence. Uh, worker rights is violence. I think that that thing that Clockwork Orange does is basically get you to see that it's all violence all the time. And we just decide whether or not some of it's righteous and some of it's um, irredeemable. And I think putting that question to the public, you know, uh, you know, right before the, uh, the, the birth of punk and right before the, the, the Thatcher revolution in the UK would have been a very uncomfortable proposition uh, for, for the folks of that era. But I, I'd love to hear it from, from somebody who looked like, what did that kind of movie do within the, within the culture of those times? Yeah. I, I think what I think people end up focusing on, you know, it's certainly what I brought up when I was talking to Jamie about the film and, and, you know, are you going to watch this with me is it has deeply uncomfortable sexual violence in that first 15 minute segment. And I do remember watching that as a, as a teen and saying, I'm watching a movie in which there's not going to be any heroes. Um, That this I'm, I'm, I need to take a step back. This is not a movie where Alex is the person who you put on your fiction suit and say, I'm Harry Potter. I'm, you know, whoever the, the bland hero is who's, who's doing the things with the more interesting people. Um, What's happening. you're, You're basically, it's perfect for Kubrick because Kubrick always wants to do this. The eye of the camera is, is observing your HAL 9,000, right? You're, you're watching, you're watching things unfold. You're you, even when you're engaging with the story emotionally, you're reacting to things you're witnessing. You're not emotionally invested in the characters as if they were your friends. Um, and 
the sexual violence is so graphic. I think people get hung up on that and that's as far as they ever get with this movie. Um, in, in, in the, the violence of like the, you know, Alex and his pals versus the other gang who they run across um, and the kind of understanding. That's why I was thinking of like the warriors or, you know, something like yeah. that and, and, and thinking of it on those levels and then realizing, okay, well there's this injustice in the system, but it's the system. So it's this fluke within the system and it's about exposing this one particular fluke. But as you said, that's not what the movie's saying at all. And what's funny is that that particular fight, like when I watch it, it's filmed almost like, um, like Keystone cops. It's ridiculous. You can tell that like, it, it, it is a fight, um, but it's almost like Kubrick makes this kind of strange decision to film it like, like slapstick. Uh, you know, you can see that like one of Alex's, you know, henchmen is going to beat up uh, this rival gang. And like he clearly got a bounce off of a trampoline off screen or off camera to, to basically be able to do like this, this double boot stomp into the, to the villain. So like the, the, the violence there and, and maybe this says bad things about American society I, that I had like no, no problem with. You know, I, I grew up watching, you know, Bugs Bunny, you know, drop anvils on people. And, you know, I think I came out OK that the the way that's particularly filmed like Kubrick almost makes a, a sort of funny tonal shift like we've been in this kind of like very spacey sort of um antiseptic kind of space future and then in that one particular moment where they have the fight at the the abandoned casino they um it, it's almost filmed for laughs like you could almost play yakety sax and play it like at 2x speed and it would look like like Benny Hill um so I find that particularly fascinating that we're, for some in some moments, Kubrick seems to find humor in the story and wants us to see it. He, he wants to like send us down these very emotional, like uh, challenging routes. But also when he thinks it's going to break us, he does something very funny. Like, for example, uh, Act 3 is filmed almost like a like a weepy melodrama. And, and you're like, well, wait, this is a character I was taught to hate. And now I'm I'm being maneuvered to, to feel sorry for him. What What's going on here? And I think that's something really unique and particularly jarring in the way this particular film is presented. Yeah, um, the, the the film also has the the, the voiceover from Alex, um, which is more or less word for word what you get out of the book, and it's a, a character who's presenting his tale of woe, um, and it, as if telling a story to friends. Um, and yeah, when you hit that part, I think it, it really taps into what was happening in the novel as far as. Um, these are the things that occurred to me and do feel sorry for me in this part. We're, we're in the part now where you get to feel sorry for me guys. Um, and I, I think that that of course, everyone's their own hero. Um, and I, I think it's a very true uh, way of looking at what ends up happening then in that third, third part. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, it's obviously completely absurd. There's no reason to feel. I always go back to that moment in Psycho where you're cheering for Norman Bates to sink the car right. and hide the evidence. Right. And, and when a director is able to pull that off and you are like, well, is, is this in just what's happening to Alex? As you're watching it? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's done. He, he killed a woman basically by raping her. You know, it took months, but she ended up dying. He ended up, he kills a woman with a giant ceramic penis, I guess. Uh, okay. and, and he actually has murdered somebody. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he's clearly scaring the shit out of his parents. He's keeping his, his parents are trapped essentially with, with they have brought in a t- live tiger into their home by having yeah. Alex there. Um, and so he, he doesn't deserve any sympathy at that point. But at the same time, you know, there's all kinds of violence now befalling him. And, and then the question of, of course, what we've removed his free will in this question, and, you know, and I don't know if the movie where the movie exactly lands as far as that, that question goes. I mean, clearly it's, you have to give everybody free will but there's no, there's no easy out in any, which is fair enough um, for, 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 for the stance of, of the film and for the real world. Absolutely. And the, the, that line is spoken by the priest, uh, the, the prison, the prison priest, the, the prison chaplain uh, who basically says that, you know, you've not, you've not made 
it, the animal God made, you've you've made something else. You've made a clockwork orange. Uh, you, you've made you made some sort of automaton that that looks like a man but is not a man. The the choice of being a man of, of being a good man or being a bad man is to have that that capability to have that will to have that drive and then to say 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 no that's that's not right it is not right to prey upon the old or the weak or the infirm uh that's that's what the message of religion is if you if the if the retraining program is successful what you will have is not a, a world full of, of christians you'll have a, a world of, of of robots and that's not that's not what creation is if the if the Judeo-Christian myths are, are worth anything, it's from the beginning we've had this drive that leads us to do amazing things, powerful things, but also terrible things. And I, I love that, at least the, the teenage me, loved that, 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 that somebody was able to articulate that. Uh, there's, there's philosophy on it, and I got to that later. But to see that presented in a movie was, was so profound. Um, and, you know, the way it kind of puts the whole edifice of religion and government into question when you start talking about what what is a, a real choice? What is a free choice versus a Hobson's choice? What is it? What does it take to have choice? Um, you know, I think all those ideas are there, and you know, there's even a, a lovely kind of echo to the the famous discussion from the Third Man from uh, uh, from from Orson Welles to to Joseph Patton, which is that you know, peace and brotherhood in Switzerland, you know, netted us the cuckoo clock, but under the Borgias we had murder. Uh, you know, assassinations of popes, uh, illegitimate children. But what we got was Michelangelo uh, and and the Renaissance. So somehow there's some sort of relationship to the greatness of man and also the the absolute rottenness of man, hinging on this thing about choice and 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 um, and, and the will to, to to seize, to take, and 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 to create. There's something very powerful, uh, and I think this film puts that in front of us, but also shows you the the worst part of it first. Yeah, um, it, it, that's why it's such an interesting pivot when you find that he has his, his choice of heavy metal is um, Ludwig van. Yeah, right. I mean, it's 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 he clearly has some part of him that taps into this thing that we. I I always took that as code for he has the ability to tap into this greatness of what humanity is capable of. And and you know music that's intended sometimes sometimes for for religious expression and uh, all that. Um, I do appreciate the Wendy Carlos score um, and and the, the, how Wendy Carlos ended up handling it. Um, but it's uh, the 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 many many angles and the facets I see in it now versus kind of how I saw the the struggles um you know some of which I, I did get more informed by by eventually reading the book um but definitely how the they they do make sure they're like what is the home life what you know that that that's shaping the the person what is the religious life what is the government and the the alex has is smart enough to he has part of them is his in his gang or this this weird gentlemanliness that they have yeah that they wear as, as if they're civilized beings who will also totally crack the other, you know, their own friend with a cane when, you know, their personal enjoyment of something is being interrupted. Right. right. Um, but he's also able to turn it on for the prison chaplain. He's able to turn it on when he walks into the prison and that's how he basically gets by for two years when he's the smallest person there. Um, it's, it's an, it's a, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing, I guess. Maybe that's the the a, a bad analogy, but he he's able to put on the trappings of society when he wants to, um, and you just start to realize a whole lot of people are doing that in the course of. And there's a reason they keep showing like the the head prison guard when he's being they're doing the demo uh, of of how it's gone with with the tra- retraining um, of this guy's one his his yeah, it's going to change his job, but he's also delighting in seeing someone who's actually changed um, versus the, you know, the, we talk about the different kinds of violence, you know, all that they have at their disposal as prison guards, as far as they're concerned is violence. Um, no, I'm, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, I think you're absolutely picking up on, you know, the, that the senior thing about the end of the demo is they're talking about 
uh, I believe it's the interior minister says that, you know, in prison, he learns the sneering civility. He, he learns to put it on. It's just in, in the same way that the lion learns, oh, I should walk in the tall grass because my mane hides me. Alex has learned that by, um, by taming his ferocity, by putting on you know, a, a purple velvet dandy coat, uh, he looks a certain way. And, and in, in that way, uh, society actually also inflicts another violence by, via fashion, is that Alex has realized that society is bullying him through fashion, but he's learned how he can use fashion in the reverse to basically open up doors for himself. Uh, the girls he meets at the record store, he knows they like the way he looks. The, he, he knows they like the way he approaches them. Um, so many other tools are, are rooted in violence, either subtle, implicit, or explicit. And this movie uh, is constantly putting up um, a new tool for control and basically saying, is this coercion or is this, uh, uh, is this some sort of uh, camouflaged bullying? You know, Alex, through the first act, shows that he is a profound bully and, and, and he will pick up any tool uh, if it allows him to, to bully better. And I, I think it's absolutely uh, fascinating to, to see that. And I think you're right, that, that sort of, uh, that, that civility, that um, lofty dated English register he'll pick up in his language when he's trying to, trying to grease somebody either with power or with, with fawning sort of supplication. He, he, he reaches for both of those when, when they're useful to him. And uh, this puts me in mind of, I think it's John Ronson's book, uh, The Psychopath Test, where he basically says that most CEOs score very high on their psycho psychopath score. And it just turns out that humans have learned and certain human populations have uh, see, seem to favor people who understand how to manipulate people through uh, smooth words, if not outright, outright bullying. And uh, I think, I think you're right is that uh, his years on the street, as it were, before he gets back into prison have armed him well to basically uh, learn how to cozy up to the chaplain cozy up to the guards, make sure that, um, you know, in an environment where he would be the weaker, he's never in a situation where, um, where he, where he has to, um, to fight his way out. He's constantly looking for an edge. He's not above fighting his way out, but he's, he's, an, he's an apex predator. He knows he doesn't want to be in a dark corner of the prison by himself with much bigger, uh, hulks around him. Right. Right. Um, I mean, and, and just, he clearly wants freedom. Um, it, it, you know, it, I don't think that that's why he would want that is ever really a question of the film. Uh, although he is, you know, he's getting his three squares a day. He's got his own space. He's, it seems like he has access to his music. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember if we were talking about it before we started recording or after we started recording um, a bit about, you know, what they were actually showing him in the films then when he goes through the conversion process. Yeah, we talked, I think we talked a little bit about before, but um, you know, just for, for people unfamiliar with the, the, the scenes, uh, largely we kind of seem like, a, we sort of see, a, uh, it reminds me of a lot of Hamlet, you know, we sort of, sort of see the mechanicals production of basically act one played out poorly on super eight kind of looking reels. Uh, basically we see a, a group of, uh, of gang members uh, engaging in, in violence. Uh, I, I believe we see them beat up a, a, a a businessman. I believe they also see we see them uh, commit a rape as well. Um, and then what's fascinating, and this uh, this is something really surprising to me, is that um, one of the films that they that Kubrick splices in is Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, which is you know widely regarded as technically outstanding filmmaking, uh, but um, you know as the kids say to say say today hashtag cringe. Uh, it's Lenny, uh, Lenny send up of, um, of, of the Nazi party. You know, it's, it's the thing where we see the, the burning torches of thousands of, of German brown shirts marching and we're led to believe, Ooh, isn't that a powerful and awesome image? Uh, and we also see Lenny on the, the crane shots showing the, um, the rippling, uh, muscles of the Hitler youth. And we also see, uh, Lenny's choice, choice of screen, um, uh, of camera positions where we basically look at uh, a very sh short Adolf Hitler underneath a very long and tall podium. So we get the sense that he's, he is in fact, the sort of Uber Minch kind of, um, uh, kind of leader. And so, you know, Kubrick is, is I think kind of nudging us in the ribs is saying that yes, beautiful art, like what I'm showing you can also have a payload of absolutely toxic content. And I think what's fascinating is that that toxic content is not just a mockery of, 
the, the first two acts of clock recordings that you've just seen, but Kubrick's also not willing to turn away from saying, also film schools, uh, look at this, you know, it puts in mind, you know, uh, Griffith's uh, Triumph of the Nation. It's like widely claimed as probably like one of the first iconic American movies, but also praising the Klan. You know, we have to own up to the fact that so many of the things that we revere and that we teach people to revere have uh, violence and potentially toxicity in them. And I think uh, Kubrick's absolutely unflinching in putting both of those propositions uh, to the audience for, for, for consideration and, and potentially rejection. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we talked about is around this before we started recording, and I said, okay, we're, we're already basically underway. We should start recording. Um, what is what it, there's a really strong undercurrent, not undercurrent, just the current on Twitter these days is if you show something, you're endorsing it. Um, and that's something that, you know, it, it, that's what I was trying to get at a little bit of like, look, I was wearing these t-shirts. It never meant I endorsed Alex's behavior. It had a lot more to do with what I was trying to say as I have witnessed this thing. I've partaken in part of this cultural conversation. And then as time kind of marched on, I was like, I don't want any confusion <laughs> as to where I stand on yeah. the characters of Clockwork Orange. Um and I think the kids today call that being a quote edgelord is that yeah. this is edgelord. This is sort of like the, the, the arch granddaddy of edgelord content. And you can basically see it in sort of a lot of people who kind of uh, claim like the Punisher sticker on the back of their car or, um, you know, a, a little bit like what we saw with uh, fight club, you know, take the red pill, you sheeple get on, get on my level. You know, I think there's a lot of that kind of um, repackaging of proto edgelord material um, and veneration of it that I think, you know, you were very wise and mature to kind of be like, oh, is this the signal I'm singing or is this the signal I'm sending or am I saying I'm into uh, 1970s cinema? And I think, you know, you were obviously, uh, you came to that, that conclusion soberly um, and, and rationally, but I think a lot of people in, in our culture don't make difference between uh, use versus mention uh, is that I can, I can, I can, quote a person, but not necessarily mean that I'm endorsing it. I think, you know, Twitter's flattened that out uh, and removed it entirely. But I, you know, I, I do think it's an important, important part to realize that as part of maturing is that you stop fetishizing, you know, these edgelord icons and you kind of say, well, wait, no, my narrative is I like film and I'm willing to be challenged by film because I like Tyler, Tyler Durden does not mean that I need to go find a bunch of other, you know, four channers to plan some sort of maneuver with, uh, with stealing lye and, and, and other bomb making chemicals that, that that's not what I need to do. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's unfortunate because I, I, the, you obviously can't really actually engage most people on, on Twitter. It's, it's a amazing feeling when you do, I will say that when you're like, Oh, we realized we were talking past each other and we've, we've actually connected and now we understand each other and we're both better for it. Maybe once a year. <laughs> no. And that's about it. But the, the, I, I get concerned. There's, I heard a, a phrase recently uh, that I'm really embracing called Disney brain. And it's, it's basically like, look in the nineties with kids media, basically all the rails were put on. Like we're never going to see smoking or drinking in a kid's thing again. Like all of the characters are going to behave within a certain pattern because Disney got hit so much with, if you show something, you're endorsing it. And, and it was often, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Disingenuous, uh, I believe. Um, I mean, there was, there was a documentary we were watching um, where they were talking about what happened with, with uh, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction. Yeah. And the person who was running some like, you know, concerned parents organization, had really leaned into that and all they could talk about, they were totally showing their hand. It was crazy, but it had been 20 years was, Oh man, as long as we leaned into that, we were getting so many donations and we were getting all these people signing up for our mailing lists. And da, 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 da. so of course we did, you know, we leaned into all of this. I don't think he was aware of like his giddiness and like how ridiculous it made him seem, but you know, it's 20 years after the fact and right. didn't help Janet Jackson in that moment. 
And there's so many people, it, it just plays on people's inability to actually watch media. And it's something that like, I understand we need to teach English lit in high schools, but we also need to start teaching media literacy and, and in how people actually view very, com- you know, things that aren't even that complicated. If you're really getting upset because there was a bad guy in a movie, I, I saw uh, something else this week that I've been thinking about literally all week since was someone saying, well, and I think Citizen Kane was much of a movie because Kane himself was a terrible hero. And I, my brain just like sparked like and, and, and fizzled out for a minute there. And it's like to watch something and assume kind of as I did watch starting to watch this at age 14 and going, oh, there's no heroes in this to watch Citizen Kane and to think we are showing you a hero going through a heroic journey is just the most mind boggling thing that, but the kids say today, uh, I believe the kids say you did not understand the assignment. (laughs) If you you watch, if you watch Kane thinking a send up of of Hearst was meant to be a a hero's journey, you need to read some more. Yeah. Well, uh, to, to guess that anybody in 2022 actually knows who Hearst was, that it is actually tying that to that one paragraph in their history book that they got in 10th grade. Right. Pretty much impossible. Right. And, and, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, 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 people have a very hard time watching media. And I think it makes watching this film sometimes very, very difficult um, because there's, it, there's so many ideas packed in there. I think more than pretty much any movie that Kubrick that I've seen of, of Kubrick's, I've probably only seen about half to th- three quarters of what he put out this one's like every minute there's something new crammed in there yeah and uh, by the way i don't know if you noticed this but when you talked about media literacy you actually make a, an interesting tie back to one of the plot points of of this story which is that um the the russian argot that they or russian influenced argot it's hinted at I, I hear and you can tell me if this is true in the book it's hinted at that that comes from um, that the Soviets have been doing subtle media infiltration in their world. And in act two, we see that um, the records that the young ladies ask Alex if he's into, um, it's, uh, I think it's like Nikolai Gogol and somebody in Zhivago. Uh, they're they're name dropping Russians. And so somehow, some, uh, some way, media is solely being used to turn the youth's interests to pro-Russia leanings. And speaking in this country, which could you know, never, after, never happen here, never happen here. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, which, which I think is hilarious. And you bring up this idea of media literacy. Um, I know your, uh, your, your, your genetic ancestors over in Finland actually have media uh, awareness as part of their components in high school because they're consistently bombarded with um, pro Russia um, memes. Uh, and by memes, I don't mean like funny images, you know, in sans serif fonts. I mean, ideas, ideas designed to slowly build groundswell um, support for, for, for Russian causes. So uh, this idea that, that what Clockwork Orange showed us, like, oh, no, that could never happen. Well, you know, <laughs> as you sort of obliquely made a humorous <laughs> reference to, yes, uh, but, but even, even more, like, it, it's so, like, not even a joke. It's, it's part of the core curriculum of some of, of what's widely rated as one of the best um, high school experiences around the world. Uh, that of Finland. So they are uh, like this idea of um, I- I- idea infection and poisoning the well of education. That is, that is, that is for real. And that is, is, is with us. And, and Kubrick presented that to uh, a 1970s society. Yeah. Um, real quick. And then I'll jump off, but off of it. But when I spent a week in Helsinki for a conference, uh, that was the first time I was exposed to Russia today. Um, yes. Right. Which RT you- as they call it. Yeah, if you've never seen the full broadcast of Russia Today, it is mind-boggling. It it's, looks exactly like U.S. cable news. Um, it behaves exactly like U.S. cable news. So if you're just flipping channels, you think you're just watching another one. But then there, the the anti-American slant in it that if you actually live in the U S you're like, okay, we're not great, but we're not that like, come on, man. It's, um, it's a whole, and, but everyone has an American accent. Like it, it, right. it, they, they are not like a bunch of Russians sitting around going, Oh, you know, those Americans it's, you know, it's right. not Boris and Natasha. It's, it's, you know, Steve from down the street. Who's, 
you know, talking crap in, in a way that if you think people are like, oh, capitalism is bad on Twitter and like, you know, take that like that's that's softball, man. That's nothing compared to what Russia today is up to. I mean, and I, I, I got to does that through in, uh, through influencer culture. Some, I, you know, being a New Yorker, I, 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 I ride our glorious subway, arguably the, the most significant subway in America. And I, I looked on YouTube and somebody was basically saying, like, why are subways in America so bad? Why can't they look like China? And then here you see somebody who looks like a, an influencer type, a, you know, nice six, but six, six pack abs and, and good smile. And he's showing uh, the glory of, of the Chinese uh, subway system, right? With, with the impl- in, inherent sort of suggestion that New York, your best city, your biggest city is just trash compared to us. And I just sat there and I was like, I wonder who funded this. Yeah. Who, who, who bought this dude a, a trip from, you know, wherever it was and promised him 1 million likes and uh, promised him that on 10 cent Baidu and so on and so forth, his, uh, his picture would show up at least 500 times. Uh, you know, the, the, the term the, the Russians had for, I believe was useful idiots. You know, I think there's a, a chance that people who don't ask too many questions, but are very, very keen to get more clicks and more likes are unwittingly or wittingly becoming part of the the useful um, useful idiot sock puppetry of, of these of these um, exterior behaviors yeah. or, or exterior actors. It, it, I I couldn't figure out thinking a little bit about that because there's there's kind of old British architecture in this, and then there's a lot of brutalism. Yeah, uh, which is something that like all of the newer things are shown to kind of be this brutalist architecture. Um, which was kind of the premier architecture of the Soviet Union. Um, I can't really think of anything they did aside from the Kremlin that isn't like every time you see some edifice of, of some, you know, here was the communications tower in the middle of, you know, Warsaw or whatever. It's like, dear God, it looks like Sauron's tower. Um, and I, I, I don't know. Kubrick has such like an adoration of things that have nice sharp angles I couldn't really figure out if he was trying to make an actual point about that of like, that is where we've gone or trying to show, because part of me is also aware when I watch conquest of the planet of the apes, for example, they're trying to indicate the future by showing brutalist architecture and their brand new studio um, studio buildings. They used as the backdrop for conquest of the planet of the apes. So I kind of went back and forth on that a little bit. And then I, I wasn't sure how much to actually read into it. Just looking at that. I mean, I mean, maybe just to step back, uh, the, the, the brutalism scene, you know, we see that after Alex has had his, his wild night out and he returns basically to what we're told is middle class, you know, respectability. The, the doorway doesn't work and the sort of uh, Diego Rivera-esque kind of, you know, socialist brothers, you know, rippling muscles working together. Mm-hmm mural in the lobby has been defaced with with giant phalluses and, and graffiti so it seems like like kubrick is, is willing to say that like these kind of noble um slavic notions of, of brotherhood and muscularity uh you know are are, are just another form of, of propaganda which is a, again another form of violence you know it seems like kubrick wants us to have, have a sort of a uh a slanted perspective on that but but speaking just in the larger um, as Kubrick so often does, is every shot is just mysterious and gorgeous uh, in, in ways that I, I, I don't have the language to express. But the fact that like Alex's bedroom has, uh, you know, like 36 small speakers, an Olivetti Valentine typewriter, an overhead projector projecting the image of uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, and then has like this sort of like kitsch macrame, like Afghan on his bed, uh, inexplicably uniting them all together on this sort of like dull, drab, earth tone carpet. You know, I, like he, we know that Kubrick had the choice to choose that. And, and he did compose it this way. And I think that's what makes so many of the scenes just um, just ripple with just like this strangeness, but also this familiarity. I, like I, whoever did the, the sets and, and made those choices, I, I somehow they just make it feel so very, very foreign. Yeah. Um, it... <sighs> Alex's room almost looks um, one. You you almost see that that sex scene, which is really the first scene I think you see of his room. Maybe you see him wake up. I can't remember. But the sex scene is basically shot as if you're looking into like um, a laboratory, or or you're, you're looking into 
purely observational. Um, yeah. I mean, Kubrick is not going for anything sexy in that sequence, clearly. Um, and the want to describe the sex scene a little bit better, which is to say that it's it's Alex, two females they met at the record store, and it's presented at like 4x speed with Wendy Carlos's cheesematic synthesizer version of the William Tell or Arcus, uh, William Tell overture, which basically completely neuters all the sexuality of it and just basically reduces it to, man, these hairless apes sure do look funny when they're trying to make more of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically how, like someone had set up a camera out in, in a zoo is very much how I felt. It's, it's completely Indeed. observational. And yeah. the, then the textures in his parents' living room are completely insane. Um, yes. And, and, and the, the mother herself, the dad looks like a dad. Like there's not much to say there. He's dressed like a seventies era dad. The mom's got like the Easter egg hair, um, which I have to be very careful because I have no issues with mermaid hair. I want to be like really, really careful. Uh, but for 1970s, there was a coded something going on there with what was going on. And she's like wearing a mini skirt. And um, it's, it's, it's just a very strange picture of, of like mom never quite decided to be, they're not showing her as a matronly figure in any way, shape or form, but they're also not sexing her up. Um, yeah. I, I wonder about that. Do you think that the 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 attractive, alluring, uh, day glow hair and the the mini skirt kind of kind of outfit was designed to basically have her reflect that um, I, I'm still sexy? Like like you know she she she's too old to be doing that. Uh, I think we would say in the West these days. But she's she's uh, my, my wife said something pretty keen when she, when we were watching this. She said what we're seeing is a society where women are coffee tables in every aspect of society, which is that like the Krova milk bar, women's bodies are literally coffee tables. And inside of the domestic space, women are uh, objects for possession and their highest use value to, to steal from the Marxists mm -hmm. is a, as, as sex objects. So for her to age, she doesn't have the option to, to do that. Her only option is to continue affecting the signs and presentation of of hot babe because there's no other purpose of a war. I think, um, I think Lauren the, the is 100% right. I hadn't put it in that many thoughts myself, but yeah, between the Corova milk bar and, and Lucy in the bar. Uh, right. And, and even the, the writer, his wife, he talks about how his wife just served him. Yes. Um, the supposedly progressive writer, and he's keeping her in an egg. <laughs> yes, yes. As I can tell, um, which I, I, I don't have enough time to unpack that. Um, and then replacing her then with David Prowse is a, a choice. <laughs> I remember yeah, being very right. confused by that when I was 14 and I first saw this movie, um, not knowing that was David Prowse. Uh, it made it made some sense when I saw him, David Prowse, walking around, you know, this multi-tiered home with the guy in the wheelchair. Um, and I, 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 I still, I think that was a bit of, of Kubrick's winkiness, um, it, it, to unpack that again, I'm not sure I have time or the mental capacity, but, um, yeah, it's a, I think Lauren is a hundred percent right on, on that of, of, because that's the only way we see women as, I mean, including the very final shot of the film, right? Oh yeah. I'd been cured and how he's kind of dealing with the, the doctor who comes in when he's in the hospital at the end, I um, mean, he's never going to take her seriously. I don't know how much he would have taken any doctor seriously who came in, but she's talking to him um, in a way to keep him really calm. And, and she's, you know, as if he's the one who's in charge in this whole scenario. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting question. Um, with that said, you know, we, we've kind of established that, you know, Alex kind of r runs amok. Alex, uh, you know, through perfidy and betrayal uh, for, for being a little bit too overbearing, basically gets uh, betrayed by his, his mates, who then promptly are part of him being sent to prison. He's uh, then reeducated using experimental program with, with drugs and, and video. I, I guess the, the question would be is that um, it, it's worth saying that, that Kubrick makes sure that every account is settled in, in, in Act 4. He basically makes sure that uh, one by one, uh, the tramp that, that Alex beat up 
uh, gets a gang to beat him up. And we feel a little bit justified in that. And then we find out that Alex's former droogs are now working as police officers. Uh, the Which hit me very about. differently now than it, it did before. And, yeah, and, for sure. And also how Alex kind of falls in line a bit like a soldier when he's in prison. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I don't, I don't want to like take away from the military, but I mean, it, 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 it is an interesting, there, nothing is done to make him a better person. Any of those people before they take on those roles, they're just given those roles. That's right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and we've seen like there, there are a number of demonstrations where they're not even learned to, the, they, they're not sufficiently educated in wielding violence well. You know, there are a number of, um, uh, you can see them on YouTube, videos of uh, perpetrators breaking, uh, ta- breaking tackle or, uh, you know, basically escaping. And so I, th- I think the idea that like maybe that police violence isn't actually this nice antiseptic, oh, I'm just going to disarm you, sir until you're no longer a threat. You know, I think, you know, the, the last several years have led to a lot of churning about what is it for the police to have a localized monopoly on violence and, and what happens, uh, are, are they always using that well? Are they devolving to, to scrapping, to street scrapping, or are they doing the least amount of uh, control to, to try to get uh, a person into submission? I, I've listened to a fascinating interview where um, w- one of the, the Gracie uh, jujitsu um you know, grandchildren is basically talking to that, like on average, police get um, about 45 minutes of training in hand to hand compliance gaining, like per, per year as part of like a continuing ed program. So it's like, how can they be expected to handle the wide variety of problems um, when you only have that little training and the, the an option B is your, your sidearm. When that's the case, they don't have the confidence to not reach for that sidearm. And, and so I think that leads to, or the, the theory presented there was that leads to escalation and, and contact because we know that, that violence is asymmetric. And uh, it, now in situations where people are caring more often, it becomes even more asymmetric. And so this question about, you know, is the only means for getting another person's compliance violence, question mark, um, you know, that Kubrick asks us to consider, you know, we're starting to see some of the, the, the real world ramifications of that in how police interact with, um, w- w- with, uh, citizens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we had our own, I know, I know there were protests, uh, in New York and, and certainly mm-hmm. we had them in, in Austin and the result of those, uh, you know, which was, was widely criticized, uh, for both sides, um, uh, of, you know, the, the cops were not using the tools they did have that were intended to de-escalate correctly. Uh, you know, beanbag guns aren't intended to be shot in someone's face from point blank range. Uh, they're intended to be bounced off the street and into somebody. Um, and that's not what was happening, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting um, reflection of, of something that just struck me as, Oh, it, it a fictional injustice when I watched this at 14 and then you watch it now and you're like, Oof, this, this feels um, people who were older than me, who knew what they were talking about, wrote this scene, you know, in, in, in the sixties and made it into a movie in the seventies. And, and I wonder a little bit to, to what degree, you know, Burgess's uh, Burgess had been posted in uh, the, the English colonies and at the time called Malaya, not Malaysia. So he saw what, what, you know, that sort of very, you know, the quiet American kind of like just how do colonial powers keep uprisings tamped down? So I suspect he probably saw some degrees of that and, and, and brings that, that, that question in when we're when the, the scope expands in the fourth and fifth act to say, like, well, what violence do institutions wield and what is the violence of an individual, even a, 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 a prodigious monster like Alex against those systems? What is what is, you know, Alex, like he, he would, he might kill you. Uh, he might flirt with you first, but he would never figure out how to engineer, say, uh, a digital store of value with pictures of monkeys and then take all of your money and run it away from you. He operates violence and risk and reward as an animal does. You know, uh, Georgie even chides him for, for thinking like a child, not thinking about the big, big money. Compare it to like what's on yeah. your average episode of Succession or Billions, or you know the the housing implosion or the savings and loan implosion. That kind of violence lions don't think about. 
it takes a certain coldness, a certain political savviness, a certain sociopathy to be able to engineer that kind of violence. And I think that's the, the kind of violence that Kubrick's asking us to think about in, in the fourth and fifth act. And ultimately at the end, um, the, the minister as sort of the, the symbol of that type of institutional violence has a, has an, a tete-a-tete and, and attempts to reach an understanding at, uh, uh, with Alex, the sort of scion of localized yeah, I mean the, the the scene of Alex kind of like at this point being the fool, uh, sitting in this hospital bed, you know, thinking he's playing the minister as he's please feed me, you're feeding me, you're 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 serving me, not realizing that with every bite, what is happening with the transfer of power between the two of them. Um, with it ending with Alex smiling like an idiot and giving the thumbs up as the, you know, next to the minister. And he's just played all, he's given away all his cards at this point. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal scene um, that made me queasy and didn't like it as a kid. And now you just have your head in your hands watching that sequence yeah. and, and how it's playing out um, and, and everything that's happening with Alex. And, but also the, some, you know, they're, they're, that's true at the same time. I think it's also, there's kind of the still photo angle on it of here's both sides of the coin. Here's, you know, here, here's basically what you're dealing with um, world as you, you know, in this image of the the smooth politician and then the, the brutal character they've brought back into being. But also I, I wondered if there wasn't supposed to be some suggestion of, you know, if Alex sticks close to this guy, what's he going to learn? That, that's true. It's like, you know, I think, I think that it makes the movie uh, uh, blow, uh, but Johnny Depp about, he says, I, I went to prison with a, with a bachelor's in marijuana and I left with a, a PhD in cocaine basically is that by, by he'd been sort of a small time grass dealer, you know, sort of hip swing in California. But by the time he got out of prison, he had le- he had basically taught distribution technology to, uh, to all those inside. And they had taught him uh, how to, how to, how to run cocaine. And so, you know, the idea that now maybe Alex's horizon of threat was just basically, you know, the local, the local neighborhood, but now he's going to get a taste of what, what real power looks like uh, when you can make another, when you can cow another head of state in the same way you cowed Dim or Georgie. And will he just go back to being a, a local hoodlum or is his, or will his eyes be now set on a, on, on a bigger prize, which I, I never thought of it, but you, you, now I could definitely see that, Alex might take all that suavity and, and use it to, um, to, to inflame people's passions to, to say, you know, and, and get them on his side. Yeah. Because the movie ends um, at that point, more or less, so, you know, you have the press come yep. in and he's being used as a puppet. Uh, he's got his giant speakers and, you know, whatever. And, and, you know, I, I, I'd been cured and they, the, the scene of rape once again, to the applause of, um, you know, the masses. Um I don't know. I took that okay, in that ahead. last scene. I, 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 I viewed that sexual contact as, um, I, I don't know. And, and the, the scene is, the scene is almost sort of like, it's more psychological than it is narrative. It, it's, I believe it's a sign of Alex enjoying all the things that his natural urges wanted him to, uh, but uh, not to be too, too graphic here, but the, but the lady's on top and she seems to be uh, celebrating while in the act with Alex, I took that to mean that Alex is uh, going to go back to pursuing, uh, if you will, beauty. He's going to go back to chasing Beethoven and and trying to uh, earn uh, affection and praise. That didn't seem like he was necessarily going to back to a life of crime. Or I think you know, in light of what you just said, maybe what he's looking at is to um, is to figure out how he can be adulated while pursuing his, his base urges again. I didn't think that that last scene was a rape. Um, but that said, I, I don't know. I think maybe Kubrick was leaving that door open for us to interpret. Hey, you're hearing Baker Street at the Signal Watch podcast, which can only mean something went horribly wrong. At this particular point in the podcast, I dropped my mic and I didn't realize that it was no longer pointed at me and we had some major audio problems. So I did try to fix them so you can get through the end of the podcast. It's just a few minutes more. So enjoy some Baker Street and enjoy the rest of the podcast. So 
so yeah, I, I do. I, I I would definitely agree that you know the the fact that there's like the gentle persons around him who are well dressed, who are applauding what's going on there. I think it's more than fair to say, yes, yeah, she's on top. Maybe it's just coitus um, in this scene. I do want to talk a little bit about that last chapter in the book and what I vaguely remember from like 1992 when I read it. Um, but at, what happens in the book at this point is Alex is just basically left to go live with his parents again. He picks up and finds a new group of guys that he's going to hang out with. He's right back to where he was. But at this point, I guess, I think the book starts when he's 18 and it ends when he's 21. And um, he, at this point, is um, sitting back in the Corova Milk Bar with these guys who are a few years younger than him. I think he says the youngest is like 15, if I remember correctly. And for some reason, he pulls out his wallet to do something. And he has he's carrying a picture of a baby in his wallet. And they all make fun of him. And he basically is like, you know, screw you guys. And however you would say it, you know, the dialect of the book. And there's this big suggestion at the end of the book that Alex needed to just mature and grow up. That the movie in no way, shape or form. And, and if you don't have that chapter would, he basically saying he's, his mates are saying he's getting soft. Um, and he's, you know, now he's thinking about the future, which is something at no point in the movie is he thinking about the future. He's th- he's totally living in the moment like an animal. Um, and it's just very much the case of, of young people, right? Is um, you live in the moment. I'm going to, you know, YOLO. I, I, I'm going to party because, you know, nothing can stop me and I'm immortal, you know, sort of thing. Um, you, that you see young people make choices like that all the time and you hit a certain point in your life where you start actually like oh crap what am I going to do to set myself up for the next 10 years the next 50 years whatever um, and Burgess never says it directly but it's, there's definitely a suggestion of like Alex left to his own devices minus the training was probably pretty close to walking away from all of this anyway uh, the way people do, um, you know, in, in many cases, we, you know, I think it's an oversimplification because also lots of people have very bad behaviors that dog them right to the grave. Right. But um, it's, if you're, even if you're just in the library and just go pick up the book and read the last chapter, it puts such a weird spin on everything that you know about Clockwork Orange and everything I thought about Clockwork Orange. And, but like, once you know it, it's, you can't unsee it. Uh, so yeah I mean for all I know that 21st chapter is floating around out there and they said it was very specifically there it, it, you know it's the 21st chapter for you know at, at what age does a does someone go from being a youth to being a man you know sort of question um, and I, I, I found that really interesting and the book's very slim the books you can probably blast through it in a night or two it's, it's, it's pretty quick reading it's not a novella but it's, it's pretty close um yeah i i don't know what to interpret that of that 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 take on it um you know i yeah it, it sounds interesting um it, I, i'm not yeah i i'd agree i, I would say i'm that also one like fact, telling you what i yeah. thought when i was 16 when i read <laughs> okay. It. okay so 30 years later if i read it i might walk away with something very different but um just those incidents kind of occurring because that's about it. That's pretty much all that happens in that chapter is like, yep, I was right back at it. I'm back in the Crova milk bar and you know, I'm carrying a picture of a baby in my wallet. My, my friend saw it and gave me shit about it. Um, it's very interesting. I, I, I am aware of a number of authors who had um, later life religious moments where they've kind of wanted to go back and revisit famous characters and put a little bit of spin on it. Yeah. You know, um, the, the trope you're kind of reminding me of there, it reminds me of like a, the, the opening of children, of uh, children of men, which says, you know, what kind of world is it when there's not the laughter of children, you know, that, that kind of dialogue, uh, it comes from, uh, I believe a, a Catholic, um, scholar, but, but the idea being is that, you know, like, Oh, the, the laughter of children and children's faces are some, somehow holy. 
and worth pursuing in, in this world, even if it costs you your own death. I, I feel some echoes there in, in this kind of idea of that, you know, just having a kid somehow changes one's mind and changes one, one's um, orientation substantially. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting proposition. Yeah. I think, I think it was more of he, his desire for something else other than, you know, he, 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 he was, I think that was the suggestion when all you've heard from him so far is like the old in and out, the, yeah. You know the the old ultra violence. You know that that's that's what he's in pursuit of, and it's this secret shame shameful thing he keeps now in his wallet, where no one's supposed to know about it. I mean, you bring up a really interesting sort of point that ha- happens in, in Act Two, which is that you know after the the craziness of the first night, um, Dim and Georgie are pitching Alex on another night out that looks more or less like the first one, and. Um, you know, we, we start to get a sense that like, if you do this every night, how, how fun can it be by the, the, you know, night one. Okay. Night two. Okay. Night three, less, 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 you know, Kierkegaard noted that, you know, the pursuit of pleasure is self-defeating by its own design. It's like, it stops becoming fun the longer you go. So I wonder if maybe this idea that Alex has to move on to, to new fields of stimulation i mean at an intellectual emotional level is that that the the old in and out the old ultra violence no longer light him up and what's actually lighting up are the interests that are appropriate to to a man um you know you know i, I that might be an implication there and i, I could definitely see that that's a I mean, interesting was, way to express it was in it. the original version i guess and was cut out and then reinserted because it was like the new, ex- you know, the, the original expanded version or whatever, when I picked up my paperback copy. Oh, interesting. Um, and it was, you know, clearly Kubrick was working from the 20 chapter book. Um, I, I don't think it changes anything else about it in a lot of ways. In other ways, I think it gives Alex um, and everybody else a little bit more of an out. Um, I think Kubrick probably heightened some things that were in suggested in the book, but uh, you know, it's it, the same way he did a lot more with The Shining than what was in the book of The Shining, you know. So, right, 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 right. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't want to, I, I wanted to share that just because it, it does change things a little bit. I, I don't know if it should change anything we just said the past hour talking about this film, but um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, there's, there's so much here, uh, the philosophy, you know, like when I first saw it, I, I didn't know anything that there's a field called linguistics and I did not know that Anthony Burgess was a, a scholar in it, but you know, there's, there's so much to uncover, you know, like, like you just pitched that you could read the book quickly, but I, I would, I would, I personally would, would be like, Ooh, what, where, what language does that come from? And why did, why did they use it? You know, that, that horror show is actually from the Russian word, um, which I would butcher, which is like, I think is Horishov, which means like really good or excellent. You know, the, the idea about like how languages drift and, and fall apart and ideas move across, I think there, you know, that's also an angle. And, you know, uh, Kubrick punning with IBM Selectrix typewriters, IBM HAL, you know, the IBM HAL connection. There, there's so much visual humor. There's uh, this rich backdrop of, of other intellectual dis, um, disciplines. There's the the confusion about what does it mean for Alex to be changed. There's the there's the the question about like well um, maybe Alex and the Interior Minister are kind of like Don Corleone talking to the Senator, right? You know, you and I are part of the same hypocrisy, Senator, but never think that applies to my family. You know, like there's there's so much there, um, and all of that comes after this just llama kick to your solar plexus of just violence and rape that opens up the movie. Um, there's so much to be said for Wendy Carlos's score. There's so much to be said for just the set dressing, for the lighting, for these gorgeous shots of um, how Kubrick composes the the, the pictures. Um, you know, the, the long tracking shots of where they're literally torturing Alex into pursuing suicide. There's just so much to pick apart. And the hard part is, is that when you say, I love Clockwork Orange, everyone just kind of recoils at you, which, which, which is a reasonable thing to do. But um, for anyone who we've not completely ruined the movie for by talking about it, um, I just, I would just say that, I, you know, for these reasons, for giving voice to philosophical ideas before you've read the, you know, 3000 pages that are required to be on the same level, it, it just packs a hell of a punch. And, you know, here we are, uh, you know, like a half century later, and it still packs that punch. 
I think that's that's why for me it's it's one of the most outstanding movies I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, I think we failed to say this was part of your canon at the beginning of the yes. episode. So, but th- this is I think that's an excellent summary of, of why you would slide it in there. Um, I mean, I, I think for myself it, in in showing me kind of like oh my god there's a different kind of cinema you know when i was a kid um and just the fact that it's a movie that every time you revisit it there's more there's more there's more you know that you can unpack the 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 viewing i did this time and i will admit i did it with um closed captions on um which i I found very very helpful uh this time um because I, I was didn't have all of the lingo, you know, baked into my brain this time. Um, it, it it's just an incredible film, and it's it's unfortunate that I don't know if anyone would if we have any directors who are both smart enough, um, maybe sociopathic enough, and um, to to actually make a movie like this again right now i mean maybe we do uh but nobody has kind of the the intelligence that i'm seeing right now to be able to pull all of these pieces together i mean of course he's working from a novel and he was able to you know leverage that heavily 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 um but like you said it's been 50 years and there's nothing close to it right now yeah, I mean, I think whatever degree Fight Club was was pretty iconic was that Fincher had to wake up every day and say, they're going to compare me to Clockwork Orange. I better bring my A-game. Um, you know, but I agree. I can't imagine that anybody could take this to a studio today and say, oh, yeah, I want to do this. You know, we live in, in a world where we're re-editing the versions that are available on streaming because we don't want people to say, you know, 80 years ago when, you're, when we made this, you know, the studio wasn't exactly very PC where we... You know, I can't imagine that any studio would, would, would pull that off. I'd say that if you wanted to look for where maybe there might be um, a glimmer of light in taking on a really hard set of ideas, I think South Korea, um, if I look at Parasite um, and, and the, you know, the sort of early parts of South Korean cinema, like Old Boy, which does not blanch at violence at all. Um, if you basically look at those kinds of, I think at that place, you might find um, a, a director or a studio that's willing to kind of blend uh, deep philosophy, deep economics, and uh, and wrenching violence together to, to tell a story. So I, I think it might still be out there, but it is impossible for me to imagine that, you know, um, should we do a spinoff about a pizza dog? You know, I, I think you know I think that's a much easier sell than uh, are we going to confront the fundamental flaws uh, of mankind? I, I you know maybe as a semicolon, I'll just say. The other hope might be is that video games will do it. You know, I think um, I know you and I don't have a slight disagreement on this, but I think that The Last of Us uh, as a video game put forth some of the the hardest realities about what it is to be a human, uh, and Last of Us Two did the same thing. So I think there's a possibility that maybe the medium for expressing hyper violence and um, providing forced moments of, of deep introspection might might be video games. It might be that that they're going to be the way we actually. Uh, look forward in, in art for these kinds of um, explorations that we can no longer expect from the studio system. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to just, Stephen referenced, like, I might disagree. And what he means by that is I just don't play video games. Um, <laughs> I, the, 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 I'll only play a solitaire on my phone. Um, so I have no context for where video games are in 2022, like, full stop. Um, so I, I know that there was always the promise of that. That was something that from when I was like RTF 101, them talking about like, you know, the avatars we would be inhabiting and the virtual worlds we'd be inhabiting. Video games have come much closer to that than Second Life or the metaverse or anything else that that's coming down the pike. Oh, here comes my giant dog. Um, oh, awesome. Is, is promising. Yeah, he's going to try and sneak in behind me. Hello, Andre. How you doing, buddy? Here he is. Yeah, yeah. There, there, if there is, if there is one good one counter signal to Alex Delarge running amok in a dystopic London, it is the love of a golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I recently adopted a 110 pound dog um, named Andre, um, and he's he, when he decides he wants attention, you don't you don't say no. 
you just give him attention because he just shows up and he will crawl right in your lap. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I do think video games potentially do have that, that ability. And of course the novel, um, but yeah, I, I think people are very interested, uh, in, in some ways in stuff like secession because there's, there's only certain kinds of violence implied. Right. Um, and the likelihood of, of anyone getting curb stomped is extremely low. That's it. Um, and like, you would know it was coming most likely in advance uh, from, from, you know, people scheming or having meetings where they say, we need to talk about Joe. And then, right. um, you know, the cut scene and then you see Joe and then, you know, people coming up behind him or whatever in the, on the wet streets. Um, so, yeah, it's a, uh, it's definitely a possibility because it's certainly video game uh, enthusiasts are, you know, you're, you're basically blasting things to begin with. So making commentary upon that seems completely appropriate. Yeah. I I'd say, you know, I know HBO is preparing to turn the last of us into a, a premiere miniseries. So, uh, you know, if that, that might whet your appetite, if you see uh, what the adaptation looks like there. Um, but, you know, uh, with, um, I, I, I would say is that, you know, some of the, the, the more philosophical AAA titles uh, had that possibility. But, you know, uh, I, I'm, very, I'm very bullish. You know, I think maybe in the U.S., you know, if I look at what was popular against Clockwork Orange, it was Clute, The French Connection, um, just an amazing slate of, of, of the, the field of, of, of top 10 earners that year was, was amazing. I look at what the, you know, 20 years ago for us, the top 10 looked like it involved X and Austin Powers in Goldmember. So, you know, we've obviously grown much more um, unwilling to take risks in, in film, like what uh, Clark Orange and, uh, and, and its cohort presented. So um, I, I, I hope uh, we're not living through that, through that feckin' period right now, but with any luck, we, we will return to it soon. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's been an inversion of, of what each medium is doing um to be to be honest um and we can you know and then of course there's a lot new a lot more mediums out there than there were in 1971 but you know movies were an absolute reaction at that time to like the brady bunch and gilligan's island like that's what you were getting if you were watching entertainment at home um like to find a show aside from like columbo or something that's even watchable from that period uh, which is i think columbo is actually a few few years after all that yeah. it's extremely hard but the um now movies are basically that same in order to bring in the most seats into a pg-13 theater um are trying to serve kind of that same gilligan's island audience and and versus hbo is like like I was looking at the HBO menu of like, Hey Lauren, um, like what's recommended for you on HBO. There were like no less than three shows about people in, in, in like the 10 shows that were showing me who were either in pornography or prostitution. Right. Right. And you're like, well, I know why they're doing that. So I will <laughs> click on this to see what this is all about. But it's also like HBO is clearly willing to take some chances that, and, and certainly Showtime that um, you know the the bookkeepers at Sony just aren't going to do right now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, thank you so much, Stephen. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I look forward to like I know you'll be floating in the tub soon and go. Oh, we should do Ernest goes to camp <laughs> or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We we'll, we'll go a little lighter next time. No, you can do whatever you want, uh, but right. um, you know, whatever whatever you feel like doing, uh, just let me know. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll we'll be back soon. Cool. Thanks, sir. Thanks for uh, having me over. Really enjoyed it. Great. Thank you.
that about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to drop on by the Signal Watch blog, where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. We'd love to hear from you, so find us online and let us know what you think. Whether you prefer email, blog comments, or social media, we'll be happy to hear from you. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind.